This is Mitchell McLam, lead pastor of Sapona Road Church in Fayetteville, North Carolina. We're so excited you found our podcast. Our prayer is that you're blessed by today's message. If you would like more information about Sapona Road Church or would like to give to this ministry, please visit our website at saponaroadchurch.com. We hope you have a great day and enjoy today's message. Father, today we step out onto the battlefield with our weapon of praise. God, the battle is yours. It's already been won. And all we can do is step out to face whatever it is that's before us. And we can step out with all that we have. And that's our worship to you. God, as we believe that there's an abundance of rain coming on the situation and we see the cloud. Father, I pray that we prepare and we put seed in the ground for what it is that you want to grow inside of us. God, that we be, we, we take Time to prepare now that we make preparation for what you're going to send our way. God, let us see a victory. Father, for what we see is the vision, and the vision gives the heart, which gives birth to the passion, which is what plays out our actions. Father, I thank you for your presence here today. Lord, I pray that as we make this transition to your word, Lord, you've already shifted the atmosphere. You've already changed the feel of the house today, God. And I pray that you soften our hearts, that our hearts would be softened for your word, God, that it would be a fertile soil, a place for the seed to fall, that it would grow root and it would grow into what you'd have it to be. Father, I pray that I would be anointing God simply to open my mouth and your word would flow out. God, just as a willing vessel, I pray that you anoint your people to hear, open our hearts, our minds, and our ears today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Would you tell this worship team how much you love them? I told you, I throw them for a loop regularly. And they're so good to me to just roll on. Mike and I missed you dearly last week. I do hope that you had a wonderful time together. I believe from everything that I hear that you did. Um, Ashton and Tommy Vinsek uh, are fantastic friends of ours, and I know they are anointed to preach the gospel and uh, to lead in worship, and I know that they had a great time with you, and I hope that you were blessed by their ministry, but I hope that Jesus blessed you through them is what it really was all about. Um, so we appreciate you allowing us to have a moment to ourselves and be away there for a little while and you to be blessed at the same time. We're excited about this evening. Um, again, as Pastor Jonathan said, if you're volunteering, if you have signed up to serve, uh, if you could be here at 530, we're going to meet right here. We want to have a time of prayer. Uh, you'll get your T-shirt, want to have a time of prayer, and just give you some instructions for the week so you know what's going on. Everybody needs to know what's going on. Amen? I like to know what's going on. If you would please turn with me to the book of Jonah. We're in this third week of this conversation. I'll catch you up a little bit. Week one, we looked at Jonah's disobedience. God gave clear instruction to get up and go to Nineveh, and the Bible says that Jonah literally turned and went the opposite direction. We talk about how every time we disobey, when we decide to go the opposite direction of God, it always costs us more, and it always takes more out of us to do the opposite of what God wants, rather than if we just shut up and did what he told us to do, right? Right? It cost him a lot, but not only did it cost him, but it cost the people around him. He got on a boat, and he was headed to, to Tarshish, and uh, the big storm came through his disobedience because God has a way of twisting things around, and he has a way of getting our attention uh, when he's called us to do something that we choose not to. And so he sends this big storm, and they finally figure out it's Jonah's fault. Jonah's the culprit. Jonah's the issue. 
So they throw him off into the sea. Those poor dudes are begging for mercy. God, don't hurt us for killing your prophet, but we're doing what we got to do. They throw him off into the sea. And the Bible says God had prepared a fish to come and swallow up Jonah. And we talked about in that moment when life is crashing down around us, when life is crazy, uh, we had, had no idea that years and years prior, God had prepared a fish to be ready for Jonah's disobedience. Right? Y'all going to be quiet today? In my mess up, in my fault, in my failure, in my insecurity, God knew long before I was ever even existing that I was going to be the way that I am, and he had prepared some way, shape, or form to get me back on track before I ever even came into the world to mess up in the first place. You with me? We serve a God that cares enough about us that he created a way out long before we ever even existed to need a way out. Right? And then we moved on to chapter 2, and we looked at this prayer, and uh, Jonah was in this great trouble. It says that he was at its wit's end. He was all about to die, that the seaweed had wrapped around his head. And I told you that the enemy simply wants to get in your mind. He wants to take away your vision because if he can make you think it's black all around me, I, I can't see anything, it must be the end, I must be dead. If he can take your vision away where you can't see a victory, then you have nothing, Right? And he prays this prayer, and he thanks God for this salvation. He thanks God for this saving grace. Thank you so much for saving me. But we fail to go back and realize that in verse 1, he's praying this prayer from inside the fish. I don't know that being inside a fish is what I would call salvation. Right? Right? Yet he appreciates in the darkness in this place that just get, it's got to be better than where he was. He was sinking and drowning in the ocean, right? He still understands that God's up to something. And this prayer that he prays, this prayer of gratefulness, thank you, God. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to do your will. He don't know if he ever lived to make it out of the fish. But he's praying this prayer from inside the fish. And then he becomes throw up. Sometimes when we mess up, we become throw up. It stinks, it's nasty, it's gross. Sometimes people don't want have to have anything to do with it. But it is what it is, right? And so finally we end up at chapter 3. And I'm going to read this to you. I'm going to just, we'll conversate through it, I guess. The Lord said in verse 1, the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I've given to you. This time, Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh. He'd have been real dumb not to, right? A city so large it took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard that Jonah was saying, what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne, took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. And then the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. No one, not even the animals from your herds, flocks, may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning, and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. I want to give you a couple truths just like we have throughout this series. There's some things that have stood out to me throughout Jonah's journey that I believe apply directly to our life. First of all, in the very first verse of this chapter, we understand that God's a God of second chances, right? I mean, how much, how much more can you mess up? How much more can you blatantly disobey God than the Bible says when he was told to go to Nineveh, he literally turned and went the opposite direction. It ain't that he said, ah, oh, I think I'll go. No, I might go this. No. 
He said, I'm going the opposite direction of what God's told me to do. You with me? First of all, I'm not God, obviously. But why do I want that dude that didn't listen to me in the first place going to talk to these people anyway? Right? If he couldn't do it right the first time, why am I going to bother? Why not let him be throw up and leave him right where he's at rather than say, hey, you need to go to Nineveh like I said. Well, Scripture's clear. The New Living Translation says it in a way, some way, kind of, sort of about this. You can find it and quote me on it. I'm really close. That the people that God has called are always called, and the giftings he's given them are never taken away. His callings and his giftings are irrevocable, which means when he told Jonah to go to Nineveh, Jonah was to go to Nineveh. It didn't matter what kind of hell, high water he had to go through. It didn't matter how bad he disobeyed the calling that was on his life to go and to tell those people, hey, if you don't change your ways, you're going to be destroyed. That didn't go nowhere. He was gifted to give the word of God, and that didn't change when he ended up in the belly of a fish. You with me? That's easy to say about Jonah. But then we start looking at us. When I get really aggravated and frustrated at life, and somebody's just absolutely ticked me off, and I don't understand... My calling to love those people has not been revoked just because of my emotion I'm in at the present time, right? When Micah does something that aggravates the ever-living snot out of me, which she never does, I just had to have somebody to use it as an example. What she does to aggravate me does not change the calling and the commitment that I've made to love her unconditionally, Right? When our kids are off the walls, and mine are little, but yours might be big, and when they've gone crazy and they're doing stupid stuff, it doesn't excuse our calling and our gifting to love them as a mother and father. When the friend has stabbed us in the back and pierced us to the core, and maybe we've been lied on or whatever it is, it doesn't change the fact I'm called to love them as my neighbor. I don't get that calling it's not revoked anymore. I still have to love them the same. Jonah got a second chance. I won't even in my notes. I got five pages left. I didn't see you last week. I heard y'all went long, so she set a new precedence for me. I'm just kidding. Jonah's disobedience cost him greatly. Not only cost him, but cost the people around him. You can overcome failure. Even after time has passed. I told you some of our story and some of our failure a couple weeks back. I'm thankful for a God of second chances. And I've seen people and I know people that have been so low. The lowest place that I've never been. But they found them place at a, at a, they've found themselves at a place that's low. And I've watched them raise up to be awesome men and women of God to do great things and walk with that testimony of that low point in life because of a second chance. The second chance wasn't only for Jonah, though. Nineveh was the whole subject of this situation in the first place, right? They were the problem. Jonah's whole issue came because Ninevites were such bad people. They don't deserve forgiveness. They don't deserve grace. They don't deserve you not to destroy their place. What about them the entire time Jonah was off doing his own thing in his own way over there messing up? I looked at this thing kind of like a timeline. 
And if you'll go with me just for a minute across, if God says, hey, this is day one. Jonah, go to Nineveh. You need to tell them it's going to be destroyed. There's a timeline ticking of when Nineveh is going to be destroyed, right? We don't know what it is. At that point, he didn't say, I'm going to destroy it in 40 days. He said, you need to go tell them it's going to be destroyed. And here's Jonah wandering off. It was supposed to be a quick journey to Nineveh, and he was supposed to spread the word, and that was supposed to be the end. But instead, he wastes these weeks of time, weeks of time, off doing his own thing, being crazy in his disobedience. And finally, we get back to the second place. All this time has passed. That's Nineveh's destruction. God had some grace on Nineveh. He had grace on him to send Jonah in the first place. But he could have just said, you know what? Jonah screwed it up. He wasted 25 of your 40 days. I'm destroying you in 15 if you don't get it straight. But he's a God of second chances because from day two, he said, Jonah, here we go again. Please don't let's go this through this all over again. Get up, go to Nineveh, and do what I told you to do. And so he goes, and the Bible says on day one, a city that would take him three days to see it all. On day one, he preaches this simple little sermon. You got 40 days to get it straight, or you're going to be destroyed. But God's second chance and his timeline was not shifted because of Jonah's disobedience. You with me? My failure and my disobedience causes hurt for people around me. But I'm thankful that my Ninevites that I'm called to preach the gospel to weren't perished because of my disobedience. You with me? He's got a second chances. I'm thankful that God was showing some grace and some patience while he was waiting on me to come around and arrive. Because whether you realize it or not, whether you want to say it or not, you've not arrived. And we better be thankful that God's showing some grace and some patience while we're arriving. In 1929 on New Year's Day, this was interesting to me. Georgia Tech played the University of California in the Rose Bowl. The first half of the game, they're playing, and Georgia Tech fumbles a ball, and this guy named Roy Regal picks up the ball. Anybody ever heard of Roy? Oh, great. So you get to be as excited as I was. Picks up the ball, and he takes off running, and he makes it a full 65-yard run before he's tackled by his teammate because he's running the wrong way. He makes it to the point the teammate catches him right as he's at the three-yard line going in the opposing, going into Georgia Tech's end zone. Tackles him at the three-yard line, but there's a team full of Georgia Tech guys that are there to push them on to the one-yard line. So the next play, they're on the one-yard line, and Georgia Tech's got the ball. They punt. They score. Halftime comes around, and all the reports say that it was silent in the locker room. Coach Nibs Price didn't say anything. What do you say? Dude, you just... And if it tells you anything, Georgia Tech won the game 8-7. to seven, So that one point is put through this whole thing out of whack. I don't say anything. Three-minute warning comes in. The guy comes in, hey, you got three minutes. And Coach Nibs looks up and he says, the same team that came off the field is going back on the field. Everybody runs out. Except for Roy. He's sitting in the corner with a towel around his shoulders crying. I want to read you the quote because I don't want to misquote him. Coach said, Roy, did you hear me? Roy's response was recorded in newspapers. 
He said, Coach, I can't do it. I've ruined you. I've ruined myself. I've ruined the University of California. I couldn't face that crowd to save my life. And Roy said, get up. Get back out there. Because the game's only half over. That hit me because it's so easy for us to throw us a pity party. Right? Nobody else wants to show up. I'd rather go sit in the corner and cry. You ain't got to come to my party. Just let me have my party. I'll mess up. I'll slip up, and it'll mess me up for days. Something happened yesterday, something so small, it was in a joke, and it was absolutely ridiculous. It messed me up for an hour and a half. It did. I knew when I said what I said, it was wrong. And it wasn't anything that would have caused me to go to hell. It wasn't a sin. It was something that just was out of my character, and it was not in my humility. And the Holy Spirit checked me, and I battled and took a whooping for an hour and a half. But Roy said, I can't do this. And Coach said, the game's only half over. And they said, you ain't never seen a man play football. Like Roy Regal when he went back out for that second half. They didn't win. They still lost by one point. The fact was he got back up. You think about Jonah. Jonah has been on a boat, to the sea, to the fish, to throw up on the beach. I think I'd go throw a pity party. But God's a God of second chances. The game's only halfway over. So Jonah goes to Nineveh, and we see all throughout this book that Nineveh is a great city. Great not meaning that it's the, the number one place to live. It's great meaning it's huge, it's full of people, and they're not good people. And here's Jonah, who obviously has got some issues. You see character issues in Jonah, just the fact that he didn't do what God asked him to do. And he stands before a great giant. He stands before this city that he's been called to change. And I don't know where we are. I don't know what giant we face. But many times I feel like Jonah standing in front of a giant. God, you called me to this great situation. You called me to this great thing. Sometimes it's, I'm not talking about ministry. I'm talking about being a daddy. <laughs> Trying to be a husband. Trying just to be a stand-up man of God is a giant in front of us many, many days. Trying to overcome our own failures and insecurities and the thoughts that go through our own mind. It's a big city. But what got me was the message. You look at a prophet like Ezekiel, and there's chapters upon chapters upon chapters of the message and the word that Ezekiel gave. This is all Jonah. And the only thing that we know about the message that Jonah gave is that little bitty line right there. So here he stands facing this giant city, this big, this big bully of a city that he's been called to go in and say, hey, you got to turn from your ways. And God only gave him five words. Five Hebrew words make up the sentence, 40 days you will be destroyed if you don't turn from your ways. It tells me that it doesn't matter how big my giant is. God has given me all I need to defeat it. 
This is a city that would have taken him three days to go around and see it. But it says that on day one, he went in shouting, you got 40 days to change your ways or God's going to destroy this. The Bible says from the greatest to the least, they begin to mourn, they begin to pray, they begin to repent. How did they even know? How did, how did they even know? He walks in on the first day, a place that would have taken him three days to spread this word. He gives out a one-liner. Hey, you got 40 days to get it right or you're going to die. God equips you to do what it is you have to do in the giant that faces you. If it's a one-liner, it don't matter if you say it to one person. Somehow, some way, some shape or form, that whole giant's going to be defeated because of the Word of God that goes out of your mouth. It says that they all believed. Even the king. So then I saw their response to the Word. There was sorrow. When was the last time we mourned over the Word of God? When was the last time that it really bothered us? That either we, hopefully not we, or the people around us won't living out the Word of God. They mourned. They were sorrowful. The Bible says that they put sackcloth on them as a sign. It was an outward symbol of the mourning they were dealing with. But then they humbled themselves. Because the Bible says that in verse 6, when the king heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robe. Some of us got to get off our high horse. That king was only who he was and where he was because God meant for him to be there. And you and I are only in the places that we are. And we're only grateful enough to be even in this time in history. Because God meant for us to be here. And if we ever forget and allow ourselves to sit on the throne of our life thinking that we did it, we're really in trouble. They were sorrowful and they were humble. But then they became praying people. As I was just reading it to you and Just a minute ago, a thought hit me. Carter, can you put up verse 7, please, sir? The king and the nobles sent this decree throughout the city. He said, no one, not even the animals from your heart, herds, or flocks may eat or drink of anything at all. Go to the next verse. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning, and everyone must pray earnestly to God. This is what hit me. I have no theological background on this whatsoever. It was just a drop in my heart a minute ago. These people weren't atheist people. They were bad people, but they knew who God was. The king himself said, we have to pray earnestly to God with a big G. He didn't say, get yourself together, and if you got a God, go pray to your God. He said, nobody eats, nobody drinks, not even your animals get anything, and you better get on your face and pray to the God. Which told me, and it may tell you, Somehow, some way, shape, or form, we can relate to the Ninevites. That's not cool. These people know who God is. He calls a fast. He said, maybe, just maybe, 
Who knows? Perhaps, even yet, God will change his mind. They were broken by the word of God. They were sorrowful by the word of God. The word of God humbled them. And the word of God forced them to pray. Not only pray, but they fasted. We started this year in a fast. And I believe wholeheartedly, as I was studying for this, I believe that the reason that God has poured out his blessings on us as a family, the reason he's poured out, well, there's new faces here today, there was new faces here last week. God's blessing us financially, and we're, we're giving and God's still blessing us financially. It's amazing. I believe that it's a response to the way we started our year. Because when we fast, it really doesn't do a whole lot for God. God could care less if you eat or not. I mean, he ain't going to let you starve. I'm, I'm not Really, though, is his stomach going to growl if you don't get good lunch today? No. Yours is, right? I promise I'm going somewhere. Some of you looking at me like I'm crazy. In the grand scheme of things, it does not affect God whether I fast. It affects me. God can be no closer to me right now than if I don't eat for the next 40 days. He is where he is. He's omnipresent. He's right here in this moment. I'm full of the Spirit. His Spirit lives within me. He's not coming any closer. Right? So me fasting does not draw him into me like I'm pulling him down from heaven. It does not, it does not do that at all. What it does is the opposite. When I'm hungry, when my body is physically struggling and I, I'm, I'm weak and I need something, my spirit, the spirit within me, gives me a new strength. And rather than me trying to pull God to me, I'm actually pulling myself closer to him to find the source of strength. Fasting does nothing to affect God. It affects you and me. Those people, when they started fasting, when they quit eating food and drink and they quit partying and they quit doing the evil that, that the king's talking about, they become close to God. And when they drew to him, he said, you know what? I don't have to destroy these people anymore. He responded. What happens if we get to a place where we mourn and we humble ourselves and fast and pray because of the word of God? You see a victory? You want to watch the victory play out? Start fasting about it. You want to see somebody come home that's been lost? You want to see a financial breakthrough in your life? I'm not I'm trying to be some prosperity, nothing. It ain't like that. If you want to see something, though, fast. Sacrifice something of yours and watch God draw you to him. He ain't coming no closer. You're going to begin to pull close to him. And here's a group of people that are so corrupt, so messed up, that the prophet of God didn't want to see them saved. Yet they got close enough to him that he said, I'm not going to destroy you. But it started with a second chance. Would you stand with me? I can play something soft. The life, this layout of Nineveh, if you will, is no different than that of a sinner, a person that doesn't know God, right? And the reason that it was so important to me earlier when I saw that it stood out to me the first time that the king had said, pray earnestly to God, was because so many people have heard the truth. So many people have heard about God. They know about God. They know there is a God. But yet, they're still on the outside of the equation, the outside of the relationship. 
And I've made it a point in my study and in my ministry to try to find the gospel of Jesus throughout everything that I read. Because from the beginning of this book to the very end of this book, Jesus is present. The ministry of the gospel is present everywhere. And you and I, if you're saved, you were once at the point that the Ninevites were. You knew of God. And somebody had to just share something so small with you. Maybe it was big. More than likely it was small. And God used something small to reach out and touch your heart and soften you just a little bit and make you realize you needed something different in your life. And there was some repentance. There was had to have been some sorrow to realize that you needed God. You were a sinner. There had to be some humility to make you realize I've got to come off my throne. I can't be Lord of my own life. I need God to direct me. It's all for my good. Why would I not want the God that created everything around me to guide my life rather than me who is just stuck in this small mind to do it? And you had to pray a prayer because the Bible says that you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. That's how you're saved. So no different than the response the Ninevites had was the response that we had. And salvation came. The ministry of the gospel is all throughout. I don't know where you've been, what your struggle is. Maybe it's something as simple as my joke yesterday that wasn't right. Don't make me out to be something I'm not. I want a dirty joke. It won't nothing like that. It was just not humble. It was a prideful moment that was not right. I'm thankful that God gives second chances. I'm thankful that when I walk in disobedience because of my own hurt and my own pain, I closed up like a turtle and withdrew in my shell. I'm thankful that God brought me back out and allowed me to go forward again and walk in the calling and the gifting that he put on my life. Because it wasn't revoked just because I messed up. There's a whole other half of this game for you to get up and go play. So you can sit in your corner and cry and mourn and and be upset and beat yourself up or you can realize we're victors in God. He's forgiven us. He's given us grace. He's given us mercy. He's called us to, attaboy, get on up and go on out there and play this game like you were created to play it. The second half is gone. The first mess up is gone. It's behind you. Repent, move on, move forward. There's a kingdom of people waiting to come into the family of God. And you're needed to make it happen. I want to pray a prayer for you, and then we're going to bring the kids in for a moment. God's given second chances. We don't, it's not a situation where you got to go beg God to give you another chance. It's done. You forget, you you ask forgiveness, you repent, you mourn over that for a moment, and you move on. You learn from that. I'm not making you, I'm not giving you an excuse to live in that moment forever. That's not what I'm saying. You repent, you change, you move on, but God's already done the second chances. It's over. But we've got a purpose. We each have a calling, a gifting on our life. It doesn't matter what you're good at, it doesn't matter what it is, whether you're just an awesome mama, you've got a gifting and a calling to be a mama. So don't let your failure of how you had to fuss your kids out to get to church this morning define the way that you walk out the rest of this day showing them the love of Jesus.
There's a second chance. But then the second half of this prayer is, we've got to respond to the Word. As people of God, we've got to respond to the Word. We need to mourn the Word. We need to humble ourselves. And we better start praying and fasting for the things not only we need in our life, for the, the people around us. It's amazing what God will do if we just ask Him. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. Just ask Him. I made a joke when we were talking about the Holy Spirit about finding car keys. I wasn't really joking. If you ask Him to give you your keys, show you where they are, the Holy Spirit will lead you to where your keys are. You have not because you ask not. We've got to respond to the Word. So you're either in one of two places somewhere in. You need a second chance. You're ready to walk in that. Or you need God to help you, to give you the humility. You need the mourning. You need to, to build the prayer life to respond to the Word. God's going to respond when we respond to the Word. Whatever it is, that's our prayer today. Would you pray with me? Father, I love you. God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your word. I thank you for second chances. I thank you for grace. I thank you for mercy, for love. God, for everything that you've given me beyond anything I ever deserved. Lord, when I messed up, failed you, had the insecurities, when I thought less of myself and who you created me to be, God, I thank you that you brought my head up. You raised my head up and said, attaboy, get back in that game. You've got more to play. You're not done yet. I thank you for the second chances. I thank you that you sent somebody by, Lord, to, to pour into our life, Lord, years ago, whatever, whenever it was, God, to show the love, to show your love to each one of us so that we could come to know you. Father, I pray that if there's one here today that don't know you and they need a second chance at this thing of life, God, I pray that something would change in their heart, something would shift in their heart today. They would find somebody to talk to, that they would come see me, Lord, that they would ask somebody around them, how, how do I know Jesus? How do I get to know Jesus? God, but I pray we walk in our second chances with a victory. We walk with authority. We walk under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, walking in that moment, walking in that second chance. Put the past behind us. The past is gone, God, but we're going to walk in what it is you've called us to from this point forward. God, and I pray that you would put a burden on our heart, that we be burdened and convicted by the Holy Spirit to respond to your word. God, that we would hear your word, that we read your word, that we integrate your word into our life. And when we integrate it in, Father, I pray that we be mournful. God, that we be sorrowful over the, the people that are breaking that, the people that, that need you, the people that are lost, God. That we have a true burden for people to come to know you. God, I pray we would humble ourselves in response to your word, knowing that you're God of all. You're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You're the author of creation. You're the one that's orchestrated everything in our life. And if we would just give it over to you, life is, is a little easier. It doesn't mean it doesn't get hard. It doesn't mean that everything gets better. It doesn't mean that we don't go through hard times, God. But it just means that as long as you're directing, as long as you're driving, I'm making better choices. I'm making a better path to get to where it is you want me to go. Father, and I pray you give us a heart for prayer. God, the things that we need moved in our life, I pray that they be moved by prayer and by fasting. God, that as we fast, as we begin to make it a personal commitment to fast, Lord, that, that you would draw us closer to you as we do without, as we sacrifice some things in our life, God. I pray that we would be closer to you, that we would draw closer to you. We would lean on you for that strength. God, and I know you're going to respond to us. That king said, who knows, maybe, maybe you wouldn't destroy Nineveh, God, and I know. Lord, if we respond to your word, you're a God of grace and a God of mercy. You're going to respond when we respond to you. Father, I thank you. I praise your name.